Hi, and welcome to the FPL Stats Fix for Game Week 31. Welcome back from the international break. In this week's video, we are going to take a look at some differentials that you may look to target as we approach the closing stages of the season. Let's get right into it. Hi everyone and welcome to the FPL Stats Fix with me Tom Campbell. You can find me on Twitter at UtterlyTC. Now last week we did a bit of a different video so I think um, what we're going to do this week is actually start to refocus in on transfer plans that you might have for your team in terms of the upcoming game weeks. Now we've got some videos coming out from FantasyFootballFix.com and some have already been released this week in relation to specific plans for game week 31. Um, there's been an awesome video already released by FPL Raptor by Ross in terms of some transfers that he's been recommending. So I highly recommend you go and take a look at that video. Obviously, Eddie will be doing his algorithm video as well. So lots of content in terms of specific transfers for Game Week 31 that you could take a look at. What I'm going to be taking a look at for you guys is to actually think about as it's approaching the close of the season, the, the, the end of the season, We've actually now um, sort of focusing on, on where we're going to finish, uh, goals in mini leagues, etc. So there was an ask to look at some differential picks. So that's what I'm going to try and do uh, for you today. I should just say I am still battling with the, uh, the uh, end stages of COVID. So apologies if I'm a bit sniffly and coughing throughout the video. I'll do my very, very best to, to get through this. But that's what we're going to do today, guys. So um, what I've decided to do first of all is the fixture analyzer here. I've just extended that out to be um, the game week 31 through until the end of the season, just so that we can see it's all very well identifying players' differentials, and we'll come on to the criteria for that in a minute. But actually, do we see those players that's actually having the requisite fixtures in place that you'd actually want to trust them? So I think that's quite important as well. So if we just scroll down here. Um, Burnley topped this chart. Now, we actually the longest lens that we can apply from an attack perspective. Burnley topped the charts in terms of um, how Fix recommends that those, um, you know, how easy those fixtures are from an attacking perspective. Obviously, they've got a lot of games to be um, rescheduled, etc. And then you can see here you've got the likes of Leicester, Arsenal, Brighton, Palace, and Man United making up the top six there. So I did find that quite interesting in terms of these are the teams attacking-wise that Fix is recommending. So when we look at the in individuals from a differential perspective, ideally from an attacking perspective, we'd want to see those players featuring within those teams. I'm just going to scroll down so that you guys can see there are some other teams here that you might be interested in, in looking at. And conversely, if I scroll all the way to the bottom... You can see here the bottom four there of Norwich and Leeds. You wouldn't necessarily be looking at those um, all together anyway with uh, their plight. Um, and Villa and Wolves, who had comparatively good seasons, but Fix doesn't like their running um, at all. West Ham, I know that we've, um, on other videos, we've talked about Antonio as well. So just in terms of the attacking fixtures, Fix doesn't actually like how West Ham's fixtures look until the end of the season. So again, the top six there of Burnley, Leicester, Arsenal, Brighton, Crystal Palace, and yes, Man United do feature. Um, as, as as well as part of that. So those are the teams from a fixtures perspective. And again, not focusing necessarily so much on Game Week 31 here. This is more if you're looking to bring in players, whether or not that be a goalkeeper, a defender, a midfielder, or a forward, and you're really looking to, to try and uh, differentiate yourself from your, um, your competitors in your mini league or from an overall rank perspective, this video should hopefully help with that. So what I have decided to do, or how I went about preparation for this video, the predicted points and stats, again, I've looked at the whole um, game week range here till the end of the season, and I'm looking at goalkeepers to start with. So I'm going to scroll down so that you can get a view of um, you know, a, a lot of options there. Um, but effectively, what I've, I've decided to do for each of the different positions, goalkeeper, defender, midfielder, and forward, I've then pulled out some of these players, and then we're going to look at some comparison metrics, um, which you can use some of the tools on fancyfootballfix.com. So um, way out in front here is Nick Pope um, in terms of the points predicted total for the remaining game weeks. Obviously, they do have upcoming doubles that we know, and Nick Pope historically as well has performed very, very well. If I pull up his um, individual dialogue box here, you can see that... Oh, sorry, guys, I should just mention by differentials, this is the approach I've taken. So maximum ownership I've taken here is 5%. Uh, that's the filter that I've applied, and that will be consistent right across the video. So these are all players that are owned by 
up to an, and including um, 5% ownership of lighting. And I think that's a reasonable um, ownership that you can actually look to target to be confident that you'd be um, differentiating yourself from the crowd. So scroll back down again and build up Nick Pope's um, dialogue box here, box here. You can see that, yes, indeed, he is. So I was kind of surprised here. He's only owned by 3.2% of teams and 2.9% of live teams. We know that um, attacking wise, Burnley have good fixtures, but obviously they've got these upcoming doubles. When I was looking through this data, though, I just thought the past season's data was quite encouraging here. Obviously, he had that injury season, but right around the sort of 150 to 160 type points um, returns is kind of typical for Nick Pope. So we've got consistency there in his level of performance. And I think at his price, which isn't completely um, easy to get to necessarily at 5.4 million, he is someone who does interest me. Again, lots of fixtures makes lots of saves, as we'll see. Um, Lucas Fabianski, as I mentioned, Fix doesn't mention doesn't like the um, attacking fixtures for West Ham, but I don't necessarily think that's that altogether a bad thing from a, um, from a goalkeeper's perspective. Because avenue to points there, it's not just clean sheets; it's actually saves as well. So Lucas Fabianski, I think, would be a really interesting one. Again, you've got very low percentage ownership here as well. And again, past season of data, he does have a kind of um, propensity to hit that kind of 150-odd point mark. Probably not as good as Nick Pope, though, and I think that's what we're going to see here as we dive into the comparison. I'll just keep this up here as well so that you can consider, if you do want to go and take a look at this yourself, these are some of the, the uh, lower-owned goal goalkeepers that you might be interested in. When I used the fixed comparison, comparison matrix here, I've selected Pope and Fabianski, respectively, um, and I've applied the lens again for the whole season here, guys, so... This is returning information. I've, I've used average per game for these two players right across the course of the season because I wanted to make sure that we had all of the information for this in, for the uh, stats that are pulled back. And, uh, you know, for goalkeepers, there's not a whole lot that you can do there in terms of their performance metrics. But the number of saves each are, respect, are expected to make per game, three per game, um, would lead to another point each for the, each of those players. Um, we've got expected goals conceded here which is again a team level metric but really similar here that you know um it, it, it's close between the two sides um despite their league's pos league position and the F fpl baseline uh, bps as well i thought that might be something that would, that would give us a clue as well in terms of when they perform well would you expect either of these goalkeepers to get more in the way of bonus points not necessarily here so i think Yes, there's a cost saving here, a price saving in terms of Fabianski 5. I just think with the number of fixtures that Burnley have, his historical record there, um, as we looked at over the past few seasons as well. Nick Pope is a really uh, interesting player that you could look to target, not just for Game Week 31, but for the remainder of the season. So I've basically gone through and done this for each of the different positions, as I mentioned. So the same long lens and for defenders here. I'm going to scroll down again. 5% ownership, as I said, guys. We've got... Um, uh, you know, a murderer's row here of interesting players to look through. Yes, they tend to come from the same teams as you'd expect, because effectively, as I've talked about in the past, um, <clears throat> the majority of the defensive points comes from clean sheets, which are a team level metrics. So the likes of, you know, uh, Connor Roberts and Tarkovsky and me all play for the same team. That doesn't surprise me that they're all grouped together uh, quite closely. You've got Eric Dyer, Kurt Zuma, for example, as well. So and right at the top there, Joel Matip. So um, I was asked a question recently as to whether or not we thought Joel Matip could cover the likes of Andy Robertson and, and or Trent Alexander-Arnold, bearing in mind the huge cost saving here. You've got 4.9 million compared to those lofty prices of the of the fullbacks there. Um, I don't think you can rely on them um, in that respect. But I do quite like the opportunity here to think about them as differential picks that could supplement those players. So what I've done here from the comparison of widen this out, we've actually got four players. And I wanted to do this because um, look effectively look at four different teams, guys. So um, Joel Matip, as I mentioned, uh, Connor Roberts, who's a really interesting player, I think, as well. Um, we've got Mr. Dyer as well, who's, who says he's playing the best football of his life, he said in a, in a, in a recent interview um, under Conte. And Kukurea as well from uh, Brighton, one of the teams who's really had a drop-off since... Um, since the January transfer window and they, they lost some some players there but still an interesting player so um, <clears throat> again I've picked up the averages per game for each of these players so we're going from, from left to right it's Matip, Roberts, Dyer, and Kukurea so minutes played um, 
you can take it to the bank that once these players start, they are expected to play and um, certainly over the 60, po 60 minute threshold, which is what we're interested in, but you know, 90 minutes really for each of those. So not a lot to, um, to learn, <coughs> excuse me, to learn there. FPL points wise, Liverpool are a top side. So Matip favoured here in relation to how many points per game he's returning and not much between the other three. Um, BPS as well. I think my reading here from a Matip perspective is whilst this is higher, I wouldn't necessarily expect Joel Matip to be featuring in the bonus points, bearing in mind the other players who are in his team. So don't get yourself too fixated on that, unfortunately. Now, shots or attempts on goal, this I did find interesting, actually. Now, obviously, a shot from a statistical perspective would actually be um, inclusive of headers, for example, rather than just necessarily like right or left-footed shots. But that's um, really encouraging as well from a Matip perspective. I think from the uh, different routes to points, the creativity side, though, on this on the right-hand side here, you've actually got over one per game being attempted from Kukurea, which I found really interesting, actually, and that might be um, encouraging. Now, as I say, Brighton have fallen off, and the thing is with these differential guys is there will be cases against them, right? This is the reason that they are differentials. If they were not differentials, um, because they've been picked by everyone, they wouldn't be featuring in the video, and there would, you know, there's going to be case a case to be made against them. But this is something that I think we just need to accept that there will be um, downsides to these players, but there might be huge upsides as well. Shot accuracy, um, not much to say here. This is quite low. It's quite amusing. They're all defenders, aren't they? But um, uh, you, you know, if you were interested in that particular one, you would have um, Connor Roberts actually as, as winning out on that one. Shots on target as well. Not much between them to be fair. But when we come down to here, to crosses and penalty area actions, I think these two um, players, so Kukure are 3.5 crosses, obviously the, the fullback there, you'd expect that to be winning over the, the two centre-backs. Um, <clears throat> and 1.5 is, is not super high for Roberts. But penalty area actions for Roberts, I found this really interesting. We know that Burnley's fixtures, as I mentioned, are really favoured by Fix, and he is only 4.4 million. So I think that um, actually... Connor Roberts here. Let's just pull up the information dialogue box here. Not someone, not an attractive pick, I would say, a Burnley 4.4 million defender. But if you are looking again for a differential, it's not going to break the bank. And if you're going to trust yourself to actually play him, then um, Connor Roberts might be someone that you actually think, you know what, he might be someone that I'm interested in investing in. So just flick back to the um, fixtures here. Burnley attacking wise we know is 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 impressive defensively it doesn't change either so um, yeah Connor Roberts was the one who, who kind of leapt out for me from that perspective and he's not going to cost you a fortune at just 4.4 million so let's move on guys and take a look at the midfielders uh, starting to get into the players now who are expecting to score goals or, and get, get us assists hopefully so again 5% ownership I'm just going to scroll down here as well now <clears throat> The person at the top of the bill here, Riyad Mahrez, is a player that I've been a huge fan of um, in terms of FPL for several seasons now. I'm just going to pause here so that you guys can take a look at the, the list beneath that. The likes of Sadio Mane, who we know sort of bridesmaid to Mo Salah, and he's going to cost you so much money at 11.7 million. But, you know, you do get a premium asset there, so the money is justified. Harvey Barnes, Jaden Sancho, and Martinelli, for example. These are the players we're going to be looking at in a moment in the comparison matrix. But Riyad Mahrez is a fascinating player because when you mention him on any kind of analytical video on Fix or on, on Twitter, etc., the immediate and completely justified pushback that you get there is you can't be certain of his minutes. And indeed, you can't, right? If I scroll down here, <clears throat> you can see that despite the two recent 90 minutes... He played in game weeks 29 um, and 28, respectively. Um, in relation to the ones before, there are these game weeks where he just gets a handful of minutes off the bench, right? Um, substituted early. So this is the rationale as to, or the, the underlying re reason, I guess, as to why Riyad Mahrez is a differential. Because you're going to have to accept that it's not an assured selection in Guardiola's team. Um, but... What, and, 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 you know, accept that that might frustrate you. But what you can say with confidence is that when he is on the pitch, goodness me, he does feature in the relation to the uh, sort of demonstrating the metrics and the attributes that you'd want in terms of shot, shots on target, for example. He just does get 
points when he's on the pitch. So this is the reason why he does uh, frustrate. If I have a look at his past seasons, though, guys, as well, he does. I mean, this is the, the anomaly, right? Wait, wait, the wonderful season he had back in fifteen sixteen, but there is this this high ceiling, right? There is a when we compared him to Pope previously, when Pope was around the one sixty mark. He does have this opportunity and these propensity to get points. So I really like Riyad Mahrez, 8.7 million. He's still owned under 5%, of course, in the selection criteria there. So I take take anyone's feedback that he's not assured of uh, minutes. Yes, you're correct in that. But I would say when he's on the pitch, you do have a great opportunity for a huge upside. So if we move on and take a look at the um, comparison matrix. So I selected the four players. I decided not to include Mane because I just thought it was not really reasonable at that price point, the 11.7 million to um, expect that. Now, I've changed this actually now to look at more kind of recent um, output here because I think form for these players is actually really important. Martinelli has now established himself in the side, for example. So I'm still looking back several game weeks, but I did think it was in relation to this particular suite of players, it was important to look at the more recent kind of form. So uh, if we scroll down here, you can see straight away each of these four guys, this leapt out of me, minutes played, none of them are assured of minutes, right? Or assured of, um, you know, getting 90 minutes or, or even uh, over the 60. So yes, that's something you're going to have to um, make your peace with if you are going to select a differential of this type, guys. I'm not going to say that they're assured of selection because they're not. However, Making or backing up my point about the points, 5.2 points per game is great, right? In terms of an average um, over a prolonged period. So Riyad Mahrez winning out on there. BPS wise, again, wouldn't necessarily expect that to generate a whole bunch of points because, again, of the peers from, from Mahrez's perspective. Uh, <clears throat> a goal every other game is fantastic for, for, for Mahrez. Assist wise, I found this quite encouraging for anyone who's, who's thinking about Harvey Barnes. I know he's got a lot of attention recently. He wins out there of this selection. He's the one who's who's um, generated most assists over that period. And actually, if I scroll down as well, attempted assists here, you can see that all of these players actually feature in that. So I do think that from a creativity perspective, there's not much to choose between them. But actually, it's um, Mares and um, Jaden Sancho who look like they're, they are the most creative. I've personally got my doubts over Man United's um, sort of um, togetherness in that squad right now, uh, bearing in mind some of the comments that we've had from Luke Shaw, Paul Pogba over the international break. But Jaden Sancho didn't actually go away with England, so would have had time to, to train with the team. So there might be something there in terms of um, the Man United midfielder. Penalty area actions here as well, 4.5 for, for Mares, 2.3 shots per game on average is 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 terrific as well. So to me, Riyad Mahrez is the standout here, guys, in terms of this the selection of these four. But um, it's not something that I can say with complete confidence that Pep Guardiola is always going to pick him. So you'd need to A, have a good substitute being prepared if he doesn't feature at all, and B, get yourself ready to be frustrated if he is on the bench and does just get a handful of minutes or it's just a cameo appearance. Um, so that's something that you would need to need to bear in mind, unfortunately. So those are the midfielder choices, guys. I'd say Riyad Mahrez wins out there, but each of those four all have good upside. Now, in terms of the um, forwards here, we've talked about it before on the FPL stats fix that there aren't a lot of options, right? Are there? They're just It's been a really difficult selection. Now I think Harry Kane has bulldozed his way into um, our thinking now, which is great. And people will be either getting him or already have him in situ. Um, Veghorst, though, from Burnley, we've talked about their fixtures already, and Mateta at Crystal Palace are the two that I'm going to feature in. So again, we're looking at 5% ownership here and potential upside. Like the, the actual overall total points returns here aren't terrific for each of either of those two players, but you've got to select three forwards, right? So I did think it was worth having a look at the two of them, and obviously Veghorst has got a ton of fixtures to have rearranged, and even in 31, people will be excited about bringing him in. I know that they will. So um, if I scroll down... Um, again, I thought really important with Mateta. It feels like Vieira has only recently started trusting him in that uh, striker berth. So that's why I've reduced the um, game week range here to be even more recent as well. And I think with Veghorst, it's still fine as he's not played a heap of minutes since signing um, in January. So um, again, I'm showing averages per game and I've pulled back some um, some attacking stats here as well. So Minutes played, they both look recently like they're going to be hitting over that 60-point threshold. 
which is good. FPL points wise, Matetas had the better recent form. Um, and I do think that that could be quite an interesting one. It would be a huge differential, actually. In fact, let's just hop back, actually, and take a little uh, glance, sideways glance here at, yeah, I mean, ownership-wise, you couldn't hope for more than this. 1.3% of live teams, 0.7% over, overall. Um, it's it's a real out-there differential. So a handful of fixtures upcoming. The Arsenal home game is a difficult one. Yes, I think Palace are playing well, but uh, so are Arsenal. So I think that would be a difficult fixture and then they've got a, a couple of away matches there neither too scary before they then have that lovely <clears throat> run of Leeds Southampton and Watford respectively so if you were to bring him in now I think it would be understandable but actually perhaps waiting until seeing how he does maybe until game week 33 that could be something that you look at as well obviously accepting his ownership might increase if he continues to do well um, if we just go back here to the comparison matrix scroll down a touch more so uh goals i think it's now two and four recently for um for mateta which is why you're seeing the 0 0.5 there and the stars are appearing on the right hand side for him so whilst i do think veghorst will be the more favored pick and i do understand that sort of more sort of recognized name sort of the talisman i guess for for burnley um and obviously they have a lot of fixtures if you really wanted guys to be an out there pick i do think Mat uh, mateta at crystal palace represents a really uh, interesting option and a massive differential so those are the picks that i've identified for you guys hopefully it's got some food for thought there um again i would say that differentials there will of course be lots of reasons why you would say mm, i don't really fancy these players but you know what that's why they're lowly owned you know if what's that saying if it was easy it would just be the way in relation to a shortcut so Hopefully, um, you've got some food for thought here in terms of goalkeepers, defenders, midfielders, and attackers. And I wish you the very, very best of luck, guys, as you decide your transfer plans for Gaming 31 and beyond. If you've enjoyed the video, do please smash a like on your way out. Do please leave a comment down below if this is the type of video that you like to see uh, from us. And do please subscribe to the FancyFootballFix.com YouTube channel and indeed to the site itself. I look forward to do talking to you all next week. Have a good week. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.